This is one of the most instantly recognisable cities in the world. Once you catch a glimpse of the bold red paint on the iconic Golden Gate Bridge and the notorious Alcatraz Island alone in the bay, you know you couldn't be anywhere else but San Francisco. It's a hive, not just for tourists, but for producers and directors looking for a set to shoot their latest blockbuster. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Well over 20 million people travel to San Francisco every year to sample its delights. But dig down beneath the surface, and I mean way, way down, and you'll see that activity is a bit of a common theme. This city, and the wider California area, is a hotspot for earthquakes. We're following breaking news, a magnitude 4.4 earthquake shaking the Bay Area overnight. Located on the west coast of the US, in the Bay Area, San Francisco sits on the North American tectonic plate. It's right on the border of the Pacific plate and divided partially by the San Andreas fault line. It's all part of an area that's earned itself a suitably villainous nickname, the Ring of Fire. More than 80% of the world's seismic events happen along this horseshoe. And if you listen to the research, you'll know that America's west coast could be in for another big quake in the coming years. But how do you prepare for an event that you can't accurately predict? This is the story of America's bold plan to make San Francisco earthquake-proof. San Francisco is no stranger to seismic activity. Aside from experiencing regular small-scale tremors, it's had its fair share of devastating earthquakes too. In 1989, the city was hit by a destructive magnitude 6.9 quake. It's terrible. There's a lot of people under there that's pent. More than 60 lives were lost, and billions of dollars worth of building damage was sustained. Turn the clocks back to 1906, and this area was recovering from an even bigger earthquake measured at magnitude 7.9. Moving northwest and southeast at more than 7,000 miles an hour, it had an explosive power equal to more than 7 million tons of TNT. To call it devastating would be an understatement. 80% of the city was turned to rubble or burned down. It led many people to abandon the wooden frame construction techniques that had been popular across America. Instead, they turned to concrete, but that comes with its own set of problems. It's hardy and durable, but not particularly ductile. And if it isn't engineered correctly to allow for at least some movement when the ground shakes, it could be at real risk of collapse during an earthquake. Now, if we could accurately predict when a large seismic event was going to happen, the risk to residents would be limited. But it's not quite that simple. According to the US Geological Survey, we should think of earthquake predictions a bit like weather forecasts. Outcomes are worked out as probabilities, offering a percentage chance over a certain period of time. And there are a few ways we collect data to let us know what's going on under the surface. When working with long timescales, we know how fast the fault lines are moving, meaning geologists can go out in the field and trench fault lines. As they dig deeper, they see further back in time, and in some places they can see evidence of earthquakes going back a thousand years or more. That's how we know how often big faults rupture and cause earthquakes. There are GPS stations attached to the ground too, which show how fast the tectonic plates are moving in relation to each other. That gives us an idea of the amount of energy that's slowly being stored and could eventually be released. Earthquakes tend to buddy up and come in clusters, which means keeping an eye on tremors can be pretty useful. None of this offers guarantees because by their nature probabilities can change. But with everything we know at the moment, the USGS says there's a 95% chance that San Francisco will face a damaging earthquake in the next 100 years. There's a 72% chance it could come in the next 30 years and measure magnitude 6.7 or more. And while that sounds like a daunting prospect, this time the city is going to be better prepared. After all, San Francisco is a key economic centre for the US and the world, due to its status as a tech hub that's birthed some of the most successful companies in history and generated untold wealth in the process. In fact, for the last 20 years, reports suggest these American tech gurus have been building massive generational wealth and funneling billions of dollars of that money into a non-traditional asset class, fine art. From Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen's $1.5 billion collection, 
to venture capitalist art collectors like Mark Anderson and Larry Ellison, or the recent headlines about the crypto entrepreneur who spent $6.2 million on the infamous banana. Going into 2025, the price appreciation of contemporary art has been outpacing more traditional assets like stock or real estate for the last 30 years. Luckily, with today's video sponsor Masterworks, you can easily invest in art yourself without needing millions of dollars or any art expertise. In fact, Masterworks' last sale was a Basquiat painting in 2024, which sold for 8 million US dollars after 1,398 days. And for every $10,000 someone invested into that Basquiat, they took home over $2,600 in profit after fees. Masterworks has had 23 of these sales to date, with realized net annualized returns of 17.6, 17.8, and 21.5%. As the art market makes headlines again, Masterworks' offerings can sell out quickly. But since so many of the B1M subscribers have signed on so far, you can get priority access using the QR code on screen, the link down there in the video description, or over at masterworks.art forward slash B1M. Now, let's get back to San Francisco. Nearly 500 miles down America's west coast, the University of California San Diego has one of the coolest bits of kit anywhere in the world for testing seismic resilience. It's called a shake table, and in 2022 it got a $17 million upgrade. It's one of the largest outdoor shake tables in the world and can reproduce the full 3D ground motions that occurred during an earthquake. That means it can move in all six degrees of freedom, up, down, left to right, pitch, roll, and yaw, just like an earthquake. And this thing has no issues with payload either. It's capable of carrying and shaking structures up to 2,000 metric tons, roughly the weight of eight Statues of Liberty. Not only that, but it can accelerate up to 4G. For context, astronauts experience a measly 3Gs during a rocket launch. Now, to really put this table to the test, the Tallwood project was created. It's the tallest full-scale structure ever built and tested on an earthquake simulator, and it's made from timber. Mass timber buildings are created by bonding layers of wood, and they're becoming ever more popular in the US. And it's not just family homes. In 2022, California's building code was updated to allow wood frame high-rises. It's why seismic testing like the Torwood project is crucial for developing structural advancements. Standing nearly 36 meters high, it was built from cross-laminated mass timber. It incorporates a rocking wall lateral system, which is basically a solid wood panel anchored to the ground with steel cables, and they contain large tension forces. Under those lateral forces, the wooden panels rock back and forth, and the cables pull the building back into place. It's then fitted with hundreds of sensors to record performance during testing. And yes, I know, we mentioned San Francisco moved towards concrete construction in the early 1900s, but that doesn't mean you still won't find some wooden frames. In the 1920s and 30s, the Golden State couldn't get enough of what were called soft story buildings. Constructed over multiple floors, they're characterized as having wood frames, large openings for shop windows or parking on the first floor, wide doors, and a lack of shear walls. They're not exactly shake-proof. In 2013, a law was passed to try and change that. So-called soft-story buildings are now required to complete retrofits. Around 6,000 have been or are being upgraded in San Francisco using technology tested and developed in locations like UC San Diego. And it's not only soft stories. The city has also added concrete buildings into its crosshairs. A process began to search for structures at risk of collapse due to ground shaking. It's called the Concrete Building Safety Program, or CBSP, and it comes under the overarching earthquake safety plan. Several of the city's most well-known locations have already been through a retrofit, including City Hall and the War Memorial Veterans Building. And while that might not come cheap, it could seriously save lives. Now, there are actually a few different ways that you can go about seismically retrofitting a building. First up, you can beef up the structural support with steel braces and frames, columns and beams. Shear walls can be added between floors to absorb and distribute lateral energy. Push or helical piers can be added to the foundations to improve ground anchorage. Dampers can be fitted. The roof and floor diaphragms can be strengthened to improve load distribution. 
And finally, you can fit base isolators, a process in which you separate a building from the ground with shock absorbers or bearings. That allows the foundations to move while keeping the building itself relatively secure. And it's this kind of retrofitting process that's currently taking place at one of the biggest and busiest sites in the Bay Area, San Francisco Airport. The port's International Terminal Building is already one of the largest base isolated structures in the world, and other facilities are now in line for an upgrade. Harvey Milk Terminal 1 reopened following a $2.4 billion rebuild. It's been fitted out with a range of features to make the space more modern and sustainable alongside an extensive seismic retrofit. It's a process that's being followed at Terminal 3, where work has begun on a $2.6 billion renovation. The seismic codes back in 1975 were significantly different than what they are today. And that allows for a lot more drift within our building structure. So a lot more movement and with a large earthquake, higher risk for failure or damage to the facility. As one of the Bay Area's key travel hubs, it's crucial that the airport not only remains functional throughout an earthquake, but also keeps people safe. SFO's Terminal 1 and Terminal 3 used what's called a steel moment frame system, but the detailing and connections weren't up to scratch, and that wasn't the only challenge the project engineers faced. You see, an earthquake that hits one area could have a completely different type of impact if it were to hit somewhere else. Areas like San Francisco, for example, have deep soft sediment and can be subject to experiencing amplified shaking. It's basically built on top of Young Bay mud that's over 100 feet deep before you get to real, any real bedrock. And the concern there in a major seismic act activity is liquefaction of that soil, which would have further settlement. And so that building was really just at the end of its useful life. And so that Terminal 1 project has been renovated and rebuilt with a sealed moment frame system. Um, the previous system was sealed moment frame as well, however, much more resilient now with the connection details and typing of that structure. Now, San Francisco Airport couldn't exactly close for renovations. It meant building completely new structures from the ground up just wasn't realistic. It also ruled out base isolators. To add them to an existing structure, engineers would need to essentially cut all the legs loose from the buildings and put each one on a slip pad to let everything slide around. That's obviously very hard to achieve in a massive airport that's still operating and full of people. Instead, the steel moment frames have been given an injection of stiffness to offer long-term stability. Now, when we talk about earthquakes, typically we refer to them by their magnitude, but engineers generally don't see projects in the same terms. When calculating what structural methods will and won't withstand a seismic event, it's not necessarily size they're looking at. Sites are instead designed to withstand whatever the specific ground motion of an area might be. And this is how it's done. What our team does is they work with our geotech engineers, get soil analysis done, and they understand what the potential of movement um, an acceleration of the soils in a seismic event would be. And with that, then, you know, we are taking that information and the team is modeling out the entire structure and being able to analyze that structure to see how it performs in an event like of that nature and with that acceleration coming through the soils up into the structure. We can't predict when an earthquake might occur, but predicting the where is a little easier. It's why so much money is being spent to prepare just in case. And yes, waiting for an earthquake that may or may not come does sound like a daunting prospect. But residents can take confidence in the fact that if it does happen, San Francisco is going to be better prepared than ever before. This video was sponsored by Masterworks. You can learn more about that at the link below. Don't forget that we're raising awareness of construction's mental health crisis and supporting charities in this space through our Get Construction Talking initiative. You can learn more and find links to support over at getconstructiontalking.org. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.